Hi Year 11s, today we're going to be looking at biodiversity. Uh, this is our second PowerPoint in the ecosystems topic, our last topic for Year 11 SACE. A lot of this content will actually become useful again next year in Year 12 in Stage 2, so this is probably an important video for you to pay attention to. We're going to lay the groundworks that's going to help with the remaining topics. Um, now in your textbook this is actually going to be chapter 4.1, remembering last week we started with classification just because it was a little make, made a bit more sense to go with classification first. So this week 4.1 and we're going to be looking at biodiversity, let's, let's begin. So first off, when we're talking about an ecosystem, we're obviously talking about all the different populations that are going to interact with each other within a community or etc. Now, there's a lot of terms that are going to be used throughout the ecosystem topic. So we've got species, populations, communities, ecosystems, biomes, biospheres, and we'll look at all of those in in detail across the different topics. Uh, at the moment, I want to focus on the words community and population, which will also involve species in the next few slides. So first off, when we talk about a species, a species, I am a species, I am an individual in the species Homo sapiens. So I'm an individual. Now, when you gather a group of us all together, so for example, my family, okay, and we're all living in the same area, okay, the rights are all living in the same area, in the same house, we're now a population. We're a population of rights, and we're living in the same area, and we are of the same species. So a population is a group of the same species, that are living together in the same area. Now, when you start to put all the different houses in my area in the neighborhood with all different populations, that's a community, so a group. Uh, populations of different species all interacting together to create a community. Each one of those populations has its own specific role to play in that community. They will generally remain in the area for that community. They're not going to get up and move. They, that's their home. Our populations generally are very limited in their distribution. They'll tend to be localised, and that means that the community will generally also be restricted to a specific area. So what we're taking away from this slide, an individual is one organism. A population is a group of that one organism living together. And a community is multiple populations all working together and working alongside each other to complete individual roles to make a community together. But what about populations and species? So again, we're going to go over that word population. A population is defined as a group of organisms of the same species. Now, if you're part of the same species, you have to have the same characteristics that are common and easily recognisable to one another. So, for example, all humans are going to be walking upright on two legs, Opposable thumbs, large brain capacity, etc. Defining a species is difficult, and we looked at that last week a little bit with classification. And it becomes even more difficult if we're only using features like structure or colour or behaviour. So it's not a great definition, but a definition for a species mm -hmm. is an organism that can reproduce with another member of that same species and produce fertile offspring, so their children can have children as well. Why is that not a great definition? Well, that doesn't help animals that asexually reproduce, because that obviously can't apply to them. Um, another way, because of that, that scientists have defined the word species is organisms that share a common gene pool. So all organisms that live together and share a gene pool, you can define them as a species as well. And that terminology will come in useful next year as well. Maintaining reproductive isolation. So we've mentioned that species can only reproduce with each with other members of their same species. Um, and we know that because species will breed together to produce fertile offspring. That means that generally two species two different species can't breed. Now there are obviously some exclusions to this rule and we'll talk about those. But Members of different species cannot breed, and there's, that's reproductive isolation. There's many different reasons why interbreeding between species can't happen. <clears throat> um, one reason is temporal isolation. So often species will produce their gametes, their sex cells, in different seasons. Um, so, for example, in the case of flowers, 
in the diagram we have up here. We have this one flower ready to release its pollen, pollen right now, whereas the flower over here is not ready. It needs a few more months before it's going to be active and ready to accept pollen from another plant. So these two different species of plants can't reproduce. Two different species can't reproduce. Um, mating recognition may be sufficiently different, and we talked about this a little bit last week. Um, so if you've got a pigeon and a magpie, a ma pigeon has a mating dance that'll walk around and do this big dance. Magpies aren't interested in that dance, so they're not going to be interested in mating with that other species. So they just have no interest with each other. Habitat preferences, they may just live in different places. So for example, I'm not going to expect a panda in China to breed with a polar bear in the Arctic because they just they're not going to get to each other. Uh, anatomical differences. Um, so for example, fish and mammals. Fish lay eggs. A whale, which is a type of mammal, does not lay eggs. So they physically, they're, they're just going to have different genitals. They're going to not be compatible with each other. They're not going to be able to mate. Um, we also have geographic isolation, which isn't mentioned in those dot points. So it's sort of along the lines with habitat preferences. But for example, here we have two foxes separated by a river. They can't swim, they can't get to each other, they're not going to be able to breed together. So two species physically can't get to each other. Now, on the odd occasion when mating between two species actually does occur, so for example, horses and mule, uh, horses and donkeys, and the offspring is actually born and survives a mule, that offspring can't reproduce itself. So the, the mule can't have children of its own. It has an odd uh, haploid number, which means it's got an odd number of chromosomes inside its cell. So it can't physically produce viable gametes. It can't have children. So the the line, family line kind of ends with that mule. Trophic levels. This is a little bit. Of, this moves on a little bit from this. Now, so now we're looking at food chains and food webs. So in an ecosystem, there's different levels of organisms, and it's like a hierarchy almost. Uh, we start off with producers, which are autotrophs. They will produce their own food. And the word autotroph actually means that auto meaning automatic, troph meaning food. So autotrophs produce their own food. That's all your plants, your trees, your algae, things in your environment that don't need to consume any other animals. They're just going to use the light from the sun to produce their own source of energy. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, are organisms that are going to eat consumers. So they're going to start eating different organisms. There's a different level of consumers. So we have first order, second order, third order, fourth order, etc. Once we get much higher than third or fourth order consumers, generally you run out of energy in a food chain or food web. So you'd only really expect to have four levels of consumers at most in a food chain or food web or in an ecosystem in general. Other terms for those, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, quaternary consumer, it doesn't matter which word you use, they're all levels of consumers. First order, primary, same thing. Your first order consumers are generally going to be herbivores, and that's because they're going to be eating the producers. Your secondary, tertiary, and quaternary consumers, they're most likely going to be carnivores, so they're going to be eating the other organisms that have eaten the producers. So they're only eating meat basically, so they have to be carnivores or omnivores if they're eating both. And it's possible for an organism in an ecosystem to be both a primary consumer and a secondary consumer. In that case you would definitely be an omnivore. <coughs> Decomposers, which we'll look at a little bit different, they they don't fit in this chain. Decomposers are going to eat any of these levels and basically just return all the nutrients that are in those animals back into the, the ecosystem, recycling all those nutrients into there. They're just going to break down the waste and dead matter. Very important. Decomposers are very important, and we'll look at that in the future week when we look at the cycles inside of an ecosystem. Um, just an interesting thing about this, and I think we'll get to it later, this topic too, with energy. Most of the energy is the same here. So most... As you move along a food chain, 10% of the energy is pushed forward. So for example, let's say I have 1,000 kilojoules of energy in my producers. Now, when the producers are eaten by, say, the primary consumer, the ant, 
it's only getting 10% of that energy. So it has to eat a lot more grass to get the energy it needs. Okay, therefore, there has to be more grass than there is ants in order to provide enough energy for the ants. And the same thing moves on. So we've got 100 kilojoules here. No, oh, sorry. We've got 100 kilojoules here. When the frog comes to eat the ant, it's only going to get 10 kilojoules of energy. So when it's 10 kilojoules of energy, it needs to eat a lot more ants. So obviously, there has to be more ants than there is frogs. Otherwise, you run out of energy in the ecosystem. So can you see why as we move up in that food chain, as we move up the hierarchy until we get to the apex predator at the top, when there's only maybe generally three or four of the apex predator in an ecosystem, that's because you're running out of energy. You're losing energy as you move up the food chain, and consequently, those animals are limited in number in order to maximize the energy that each one gets. There's only enough energy to sustain a few as you go on. Different factors that can affect ecosystems. So we've got abiotic factors and biotic factors. Remembering that any time you see the letter A in front of a word in biology, it means without. So abiotic factors are non-living factors. Um, abiotic factors can include things like climate, climate factors, so low and high temperatures, the amount of wind, the amount of sun, the amount of rain. You can include soil factors such as pH, mineral composition, water retention, soil movement. You could talk about disturbances like fire or frost, toxic substances, so chemicals, etc. Salinity of the water, level of water, how strong the water is in a stream or a river, the depth and the turbidity of the water in a lake. All these things are abiotic factors. Um, in Australia, most of our plants are, have adapted to be fire resistant. Um, that allows them to survive in the harsh temperatures of Australia, where we've obviously got high temperatures and lots of bushfires. So something like the eucalyptus trees, they'll actually have, they've got oil in them that's going to make that fire burn stronger to allow all the other organisms to burn up. The eucalyptus, eucalyptus tree survives, gets all the nutrients and energy from the ecosystem to itself. So something like that thrives under fire conditions. There are some other plants in Australia that have to have fire for in order to seed to germinate and for that plant to start growing. Biotic factors, obviously without the A there, biotic factors are your living factors in the environment. So you're going to be looking at things like competition, so different organisms competing for food or habitats, etc. Predation, is there any other species preying on it, trying to eat them? Mutualism, so when two species work together to gain an advantage for both of those species. Communalism, when only one species is benefiting and the other one just has no change at all. Then you've got things like parasitism, where you're going to have one species benefits and the other species is harmed. But biotic factor is basically one animal changing the physical or chemical environment that will help or prevent others from living in that environment. So, for example, earthworms help aerate the soil, recycle nutrients, allows plants to grow in that soil. On the other hand, we've got things like buffalo, horses, cows that will graze and go through those areas and prevent any more vegetation from growing, preventing other species from coming in. That's a biotic factor. Decomposers, I told you we'd get back to those. So decomposers include things like bacteria, fungi, termites, earthworms, and as we said before, their major contribution to an ecosystem is breaking down organic matter returning those resources back to the environment so they can be reused. So nutrients are never lost from an environment, from an ecosystem. They're only recycled, whereas energy is lost. Energy, we've talked about that before. Energy is lost as you move up a feed chain. Nutrients are not. Decomposers generally work well in high temperatures and in humid environments. They'll basically use the minerals for growth and then they'll break down organic matter, returning it to the soil where it's come from originally, and the whole process starts again. Biodiversity. So we're looking at biodiversity now, not the PowerPoint's actually about. Uh, biodiversity, very simple slide here, biodiversity is just the variety of all different things, all living things. It talks about the diversity in genetics, species, and ecosystems, so three different levels there. Biodiversity can be in the genetics, the species, or the ecosystems. The word itself tells you what it should be doing. Bio, biology, life, diversity, variety. So variety in life. 
So let's start with genetic diversity. Sorry, it's cut off a bit by the picture there. Uh, genetic diversity refers to the variation in the number and type of genes in an organism, not just in an organism, in the population of that organism. So when we're talking about genetic diversity, we talk about the population, not the individual. Each individual is going to have a slightly different form of the gene, allele, due to random mutations, but the entire population will have the same genetic information, so the populations will then be diversified across. And variations can change the genotype and phenotype of an individual, and it's important that we have genetic variability in an ecosystem because it helps us to produce healthy and fertile offspring, so one disease can't come through and wipe out the entire, entire population. Um, which helps us resist disease and helps animals actually change when the environment changes, like with the peppered moths last week. When the environment changes, the peppered moths were able to adapt because they had the difference in that genetic information in their populations. If they didn't, they would have all died from predation and we wouldn't have the peppered moths anymore. Species diversity. Uh, so it refers to the number of individuals in a population and the number of species in a given ecosystem. So the distribution of living organisms is always influenced by abiotic factors and so non-living factors. When species diversity is low, ecosystems are generally found to be having harsh abiotic conditions and they're not going to be able to survive changes very well. Um, so for example, Arctic ecosystems, we've got very harsh conditions over there. If those conditions were to change, most of the food ecosystem there would collapse because there's low species diversity. Something like a tropical rainforest has very favourable conditions for all organisms. Therefore, you find the species diversity is quite high and it's quite resistant to change. The animals and species there will be quite happy to adapt to any change that's happening. Lastly, ecosystems diversity. Ecosystem diversity describes the variety of biological communities, their associations with the ecosystems in which they live. So basically, a species will not survive in an ecosystem if one or more of its requirements become limited. So the higher the biodiversity level in an ecosystem, the more stable that ecosystem is, the more resistant it is to change.